see. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We want to begin by thanking you, the audience, for coming out to support this event today. It's uh, very encouraging to see such a robust audience on a Friday afternoon coming here and talk about Chinese art. And so thank you. Next, I want to thank the Lee family. They have been supporting this lecture series for a long time, and especially Howard Lee, Norma Lee, Jennifer Lee, uh, the rest of their family. Do you want to stand up and uh, be recognized? Thank you. I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about why this lecture series is so important, but I want to uh, continue on with my thanks. And the Sammy Lee lecture series, we have a selection committee that helps us select our speaker each year. And I want to thank the members of that committee, which includes Professor Hui Shu Lee, who is to uh, my right. Howard Lee, who you just met, is also a member of the committee. Min Lee, Professor in Asian Languages and Cultures and Archaeology. Sonia Lee from USC. None of those Lees are related, by the way. <laughs> That's purely coincidence. Uh, Professor Stephanie Balkwell and Mai Hui Jun from Asian Languages and Cultures. Professor Emeritus uh, Hong Xiang Zhou and David Scabber, the Dean of Humanities here at UCLA. That's our committee. And so thanks to all of them for their service. And special acknowledgments to Hui Xu in particular, because this year she really went above and beyond in terms of her contributions to the planning and logistics. Others that have supported this year's event in different ways include the Center for Chinese Studies Assistant Director, Esther Zhou. Where's Esther? Esther is kind of the mover and shaker behind the scenes that makes so much of our work possible. Uh, Jayan Mee from uh, Princeton, New Jersey, who helped with some logistics. Peggy McNerney, Cindy Fan, Lothar von Falkenhausen, and our graduate students, Natalie Zhang and Phoenix Chan, who are here. You'll meet them in a few minutes. Um, all of them, I just want to express my thanks. And most of all, I want to thank our two featured speakers, Professor uh, Yinwei Chang from University of Chicago and the New York-based artist, Mr. Hong Yu Zhang. Uh, Professor Lin is unfortunately unable to be here in person for our event. He will be presenting tomorrow via Zoom, uh, but he will not unfortunately be here in person. But we do have Zhang Lao here, and this is a really a wonderful way to celebrate his career and his wonderful achievements in the universe of contemporary art. For many years, the Sammy Lee Lecture Series has featured two separate events. One is a seminar, seminar style component, and the other is a lecture. This is the seminar that you're in today. And although it's focused on graduate students from UCLA, it's also open to the public, and we like to make these events as open and accessible as possible. And we kind of took it even farther this year by involving two of our graduate students into the panel, and you're going to hear from them very soon. Um, the Sammy Yuguan Lee Lecture Series was first established in 1982. So this is the 40th anniversary of the series. And over the years, we have featured some of the most important art history specialists, archaeologists, curators, working in the field of Chinese art, art history, and archaeology over the last half a century. Some past speakers include Michael Lowe, Wu Hong, Ellen Johnston Liang, Eugene Wong, uh, Tang Ji Gun, Jonathan Hay, Martin Powers, Robert Mowry, uh, Chen Shen Bai, Peter Sturman, Jerome Silvergeld, the list goes on and on. Some of you might recognize those names. If you're in the field, you probably recognize that as a kind of mini history of art and art, art history. Uh, these are the people who have not only been outstanding scholars, but they have collectively written the history of Chinese art and archaeology over the course of this last 50 years or so. They have provided the critical matrices through which we view the field today. And so on the occasion of the 40th anniversary, um, I think we should really celebrate the achievements of the Lee family for enabling us to do this and bring all of these incredible scholars together every year to reflect on the state of the field, on new discoveries, and interesting readings of works of Chinese art and archaeology. On the occasion of the 40th anniversary, we decided we wanted to do something a little different and feature not just one speaker, but two speakers. And I thought we were being innovative by doing that. But when I looked into the history of the field, I realized 
Actually, there were years past where we had as many as four speakers, uh, such as 1986, where we had uh, Huang Jinglue, uh, Huang Zhanyue, Mai Yinghao, and Zhang Zhipan. And they gave up a group presentation on the state of archaeology in China. Maybe Howard remembers that lecture. I was yeah, before my time. Uh, but one thing that does set this year apart from other previous incarnations is that we have a contemporary artist as one of our future speakers. And this is the first time we have done that. Uh, by the way, this is also Hong Su Zhang's 40th year coming to the United States. And so that was a detail that when I heard that, it kind of reaffirmed that there's some kind of strange power at work to bring this all together and make this happen. So without further ado, in order to get the program moving, I want to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Professor Hui Shu Li, she's going to introduce our speaker, our graduate student speakers, and kind of serve as master of ceremonies for the event today. Professor Li holds a doctorate from Yale University. She is a professor in the Department of Art History here at UCLA and the author of such books as Exquisite Moments, West Lake and Southern Song, and Empress Art and Agency in Song Dynasty China. So we love her you. Take it away. Thank you, Michael. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I have been thinking because uh, I have known a visually artist, um, uh, Zhang Hongzhu, for almost 30 years. So, um, and today, actually, we did our preparation in advance. So, uh, later, uh, our two graduate students who specialize in the field of modern contemporary is going to take over and have uh, given an overview. So I'm not going into the detail to introduce artists. Instead, I, I think I'm going to talk about my personal encounter <laughs> who is the artist. Um, this, I think you know, this is a, uh, because in Chinese or something, I, I do believe in number. Number is very interesting. Um, because first I thought about uh, 1982, the beginning of the Sanity Lecture Series, right? And that's the year. Uh, someone to arrive in New York. So he has been in the uh, uh, States for 40 years. He seeded his time in China, 30 years in the United States. <laughs> so um, the number is really something. So um, my personal um, encounter with him was back to 1995 when I was teaching in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, he was our artist investor. Um, so we launched an exhibition, published catalog, and also when he arrived there, a student was so um, excited because uh, um, Zhang Hongtou is known for his creation of the so-called Mao Park. So uh, when I was in uh, Hong Kong, you know, I remember clearly the South China Daily Post, and uh, several times we ran a cover story of how cool was Hong Kong with a uh, uh, Hong Kong-based uh, fashion designer, Vivi T. Kim, created um, you know, this image uh, that I created by uh, Hong Tu and printed on t-shirt or printed on fabric. And so our students, they just volunteer themselves um, to organize a one-way show to open the, um, the exhibition. <laughs> and Hong Tu immediately, uh, you know, he, he, he was so excited about uh, first time um, it's in Hong Kong. So he went to the street, he took 100,000 photos. So he created a, a mouse silhouette cut out and uh, immediately installed you know, a gate. Uh, and the gate is for the one show in him. And also, so he uh, put the two signs. When you enter, you see the gate with the mouse silhouette with a photo of the street scene, uh, landscape of Hong Kong, frame the mouse silhouette. Um, the, the, the label is anxious, but after the, this ex ex exhibition, upon um, uh, exiting, you see the exit sign. So I still remember that really vividly. So it's almost uh, 30 years. But the um, in the past uh, 30 some years, Zhang uh, Hongtu has been the leading subject for my key art historian. historian. Uh, there were so many articles books and exhibition kind of published focus on, on him discussing uh, his um, art. So I think he's one of the most engaging artists, leading artists uh, through, you know, and also his personal experience. I think he's a, a person 
uh, this personal journey is really difficult for the big times. So that's, of course, um, um, given a lot of uh, inspiration. But also, I think um, Zhang Feng, um, not just an artist, he's also a thinker. And he always kind of um, at the moment and reflecting you know, to the past, not just the, the bad past, but also recent past and what he has personally been uh, um, experienced. So, so in other words, I told you concentrate the capacity between the past, present, and pointing, you know, projecting something of concern to the, uh, the future. But also um, his personal experience in almost half half, half of his lifetime um, in China and half in New York and outside China. So this, uh, you know, uh, how to kind of uh, bridge between, you know, uh, beyond um, uh, between his Chinese uh, heritage and, and try to have a conversation as possible. So I, I think that makes him truly kind of uh, unique. Um, so the um, one of these series uh, from the turn of um, the the turn of the millennium, I think about the 1998 to like 2008, is a series of these uh, you know, kind of engagements, a classical Chinese artwork, uh, classical painting that um, is I teach all the time. Including actually after the event, I'll, I will encourage you to go up to the second floor. Uh, we organized or did the exhibition utilizing the um, extremely fine quality, extremely uh, original size of uh, Norwegian artwork, and all the classical uh, Chinese songs are painted the second floor at the entrance of the uh, East Asian collection. And uh, including some artwork that uh, uh, artists sent home to have the serious dialogue with. Um, so it's, it's just a wonderful occasion that we are teaching this big um, survey course in Chinese art with Carly Yota Van Rotenhausen, who's here in the audience. We have the exhibition and then we have the artist. So I, I feel that you know, this is um, so rich now that we are in the present, we are in dialogue with time and space. So um, the, uh, if you have time, you'll come to see the exhibition. And today, we feel we've been teaching, you know, talking all the time. So I feel we have the opportunity, and I have two um, my advisees. Um, I um, by training I'm a classicist, but I cover modern contemporary and teaching. So our um, two experts in modern contemporary art, you know, our two <laughs> graduate students, uh, Natalie Zhang and Felix Chen. Uh, Natalie um, has been working on modern uh, and to work on contemporary. She's also deeply interested in um, gender study and also um, Asian, Asian and Chinese American issues. Um, and um, Felix uh, is also modern contemporary, original more contemporary, and he's very experienced in photography. And, uh, but he has been working on photography and also, you know, conceptual art. Um, the, um, so this is, uh, you know, their area of specialty. Um, so um, I think that um, later, uh, Natalie uh, will have more detailed uh, uh, introduction of uh, our external home tool and also the PowerPoint overview of his artistic career. And then, you know, uh, Felix will pick up and then we have all joined the conversation among all of us who is artists from home tour and also welcome to pitch in anytime you have any thought. Okay, so now I'm going to turn the podium to Natalie. Hi everyone. Thank you, Professor Lee, for the generous introduction. Um, again, my name is Natalie Zhang. I'm a graduate from the UCLA Art History Department, and I'm very, very honored to have the opportunity today to introduce the artist Wang Hong Fu. Um, and like Professor Lee said, following my presentation, which serves as an overview of John Hong's artistic career, my colleague Felix Chen will be moderating um, a conversation, and you are more than welcome to ask questions. Co-moderate. So, <laughs> okay, very so nice. we will begin. Welcome to today's talk from Material Mao to Repainting Chinese Shan Shui. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Esther? Can we dim the light a little bit? I 
much. That's fine. Okay, I will begin now. Um, so in 1943, John Holmes was born in Pingyang, Gansu province, to a devout Muslim family. It was only after relocating to Beijing from Gansu that John Holmes acknowledged his marginalized identity. As part of the Muslim minority in China, he and his family were cultural outsiders. And the family's religious and economic background would increasingly become a political burden under communist leadership. John's experiences and feelings of being in the periphery and his interest in cultural hybridity would eventually become foundational to his future work as an artist. And in spite of his father's disapproval, John began studying art at the high school attached to Beijing's prestigious Central Academy of Arts in 1960. Here he studied Western painting and drawing in the socialist realist style, which is a formally realistic, thematically artificial style of painting that emerged in Russia in the years following the communist revolution of 1917. For art students in Zhang's generation, European art history stopped before French Impressionism, and everything onwards was deemed to be corrupt, reactionary, and decadent, in opposition to the utopian ideals of the Chinese Communist Party. Hence, the artwork by canonical figures that we know, such as Picasso, Cezanne, and Renoir, would be censured and condemned. Paradoxically, Zhang Hongtu developed a taste for the same art that was being publicly denounced. Little did he know that they would re-enter his life decades later, as works that he would be in constant conversation with. After graduating in 1964, Zhang enrolled at the Central Academy of Arts and Crafts, where he trained as a commercial artist. Two years later, in 1966, the Cultural Revolution, a radical socio-political movement led by Mao Zedong that sought to reconstruct a society free from capitalist influences began. And thus, Zhang's art studies effectively came to a halt. During the Cultural Revolution, political activity was prioritized over schooling. And thus, Zhang Hongzhu would travel across China with a group of friends, utilizing his artistic skills in service of the revolution by printing and disseminating propaganda leaflets. Excited to go see the world and to preach Maoist ideology, Zhang and his friends bore flags and a portrait of Mao while making pilgrimages to places such as Chairman Mao's birthplace. However, the time that Zhang returned to Beijing, the Cultural Revolution had taken a turn, blighting his own family. His family background and interest in Western art would label him as a so-called bad seed. So Zhang's initial optimism and trust in Chairman Mao's ideologies would turn into feelings of betrayal and resentment as he was forced to publicly criticize his family, his own paintings, and endear denunciation by his own friends. In 1973, Zhang was assigned to work with the Beijing Jewelry Import-Export Company, where he spent nearly a decade as a professional jewelry designer. During this period, Zhang joined the art group Tongdairen, or the Contemporaries, who would become the first unofficial art group to exhibit at the National Art Gallery. His work, you see here at the bottom right, Wan Sui, or Eternal Life, a painting of an anonymous artisan sculpting a now famous tiger statue for the tomb of Han Dynasty General Ho Chu Bing, attracted major attention during its showing. The title that Zhang selected, which references the oft-used phrase, Mao Zhu Xi Wan Sui, or eternal life to Chairman Mao, cheekily asks his audience to consider who will truly outlast what. Clearly, art has the power to outlast the individual. And so, almost a decade after working as a jewelry designer, Zhang suggested that his supervisors send him to the Mogao Caves in Dunhuang to gather design ideas for jewelry. The 29 days he spent in Dunhuang in 1981 would be very revelatory um, as the cross-cultural aesthetic changes that resulted in an unconventional usage of color, line, and narrative structure that he saw in the cave paintings um, struck him and they were far from the confines of his socialist realist artistic training. So in pursuit of the creative freedom and, and, and becoming the artist that he could not be in China, Zhang relocated to New York City in 1982, where he worked temporary jobs in construction while taking courses at the Art Students League in New York. Above is the first painting that Zhang made in New York, Tangrenjie, A View of Chinatown. His time at the Art Students League was rejuvenating as he found his teachers, particularly Richard Pusey Dart, nurturers of creativity as opposed to having a corrective pedagogic approach. 
As a cultural outsider in both China and the United States, Zhang valued the culture of hybridity at the Art Students League, eager to exchange ideas with the diverse roster of students who also attended. His time there influenced the creation of somatic sculptural relief works that distanced themselves from the colorful figurative portraits and landscapes that he had once exclusively known. So Zhang had a breakthrough in his career in 1987 when he took his brush to a canister of Quaker oats. Every morning when he sat down for breakfast, he noticed that the Quaker man logo was as omnipresent in his life as Chairman Mao had once been. With only a few strokes, he turned the quintessentially American icon into a Chinese one. In Quaker Oats Mao, Zhang criticizes the ubiquity and power of Chairman Mao Zedong's image in China by imposing iconic features of Mao, such as hair and clothing, onto the Quaker Oats man. Zhang's art was obviously not well received by China, where Mao's image was almost sacred, nor the Quaker Oats Company, which was anti communist. This event marked the beginning of Zhang's long-lived Chairman Mao series and his sustained engagement with Chinese and Western icons. Zhang only accelerated his satirizing and playful engagement with cultural signifiers even after the events that transpired at the Tiananmen Square protests and massacre of 1989. This time he continued to mix cultural iconographies and tackle the monumental artwork in Western art history, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, and replaced Jesus and all of his disciples with figures of Chairman Mao Zedong. Zhang satirized the communist idolization of Mao and the chairman's betrayal of his own ideological scriptures when he fell from grace. The Last Banquet is, also, is additionally considered one of Zhang's most controversial works to date. Um, it was ironically denounced as sacrilegious by former Massachusetts Senator Edward Kennedy and barred from being included in an exhibition at Capitol Hill that aimed to protest Chinese censorship. So Quaker Oats Mao and the last banquet essentially set the stage for Zhang's subsequent works, which in the words of art historian Jerome Silvergel, are a form of cross-cultural iconoclasm designed to offend all audiences equally elicit laughter and facilitate a deeper political understanding. The Chairman Mao and the Material Mao series do exactly that. The Chairman Mao series is demonstrative of Zhang's foray into creatively reappropriating and melding different cultural iconographies. For example, the portrait of Mao with a thick Stalinesque mustache entitled HIACS, he is a Chinese Stalin, place homage to Dada artist Marcel Duchamp's LHOOQ, a humorously defiled image of Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. His portrait of the chairman in pigtails, a satirization of Mao's quotes, the masses are the real heroes, while we ourselves are often childish and ignorant, gained notoriety and even facilitated his crossover into the world of fashion. And as Professor Lee mentioned in 1994, designer Vivian Tam adorned t-shirts and dresses with Zhang's portraits. Made approximately three decades after the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, the results were playful and cheeky, undermining the presentation of Mao that had once communicated his status as a powerful, paternal, and charismatic leader. In his Material Mao series, Zhang cut Mao silhouettes out of different materials, such as corn, soy sauce, grass, fur, brick, stone, and even iron. While attempting to empty the image of Mao of its meaning and distance himself from it, the chairman remains. His presence is in his absence. Zhang has said, if you stare at a red shape for a long time, when you turn away, your retina will hold the image, but you will see a green version of the same shape. In the same way, when I lived in China, I saw the positive image of Mao so many times that my mind now holds a negative image of Mao. In my art, I'm transferring this psychological feeling to a physical object. Part of the series is the interactive installation, Ping Pong Mao, which is a ping pong table with the unmistakable silhouette of Chairman Mao carved out at each side of the net. The installation references the inescapable association of the sport with Mao's ping pong diplomacy, a Chinese political tactic in the early 1970s when Mao invited the US table tennis team to China. 
Zhang not only continued to fuse the East and West, but also the high and low. A 1996 work from Soy Sauce Calligraphy, a series that Zhang began in 1995, creatively reappropriated the style of Wang Qizhi, China's most venerated calligrapher. Instead of using ink and silk, Zhang chose soy sauce and a very rough, inexpensive paper that was ubiquitous in Chinatown stores. Beyond the facade of elegant calligraphy, the content of the text is actually a help wanted ad for a Chinatown sweatshop. By combining mundane materials with important cultural signifiers, Zhang not only highlighted the beauty of the profane, but also the gaps between the elegant, revered Chinese literati traditions and the sobering reality of emigre life in Chinatown. Zhang has also grappled with matters of tradition versus contemporary, contemporaneity and high versus low across other mediums. In 2002, he playfully commented on the effects of globalization in China by fashioning a McDonald's hamburger French fry container, as well as a forking knife in the style of a Shang Chinese bronze. Adorned with zoomorphic Taotia motifs significant to ritual, the McDonald's vessels juxtaposes ancient China with contemporary America and ritual art with consumer culture, a very whimsical critique of systems of power. Similarly, in Coco Cola, John comments on the reach of modern consumerism and popular culture through making a hybrid Coca-Cola bottle. While retaining the distinct silhouette of a glass Coca-Cola bottle, the bottles are made in the blue and white style of Ming Dynasty porcelain. Much like Coca-Cola products, blue and white porcelain possessed distinct branding that made it coveted and internationally renowned. Zhang's 1998 series, Repaint Shanshui, deliberately reimagines Shanshui paintings by Chinese classical masters from the Song to the Ming and Qing dynasties, such as Fan Huan, Bo Xi, Zhao Mengfu, Shi Tao, Ba Da Shanren, and Wang Yanqi, through the respective styles of European artists such as Paul Cezanne, Claude Monet, and Vincent van Gogh. Here, Zhang contends with the complex intersections of two cultures through technique, practice, and form. His works cross cultural identities are made especially apparent when viewed by Chinese and Western audiences. Some individuals immediately identify the compositions with artists like Bo Xi and Fan Huan, while others first acknowledge the styles of Monet and Van Gogh. The Repaint Shanshui series is not solely concerned with emulation, but it more so raises questions about the mixing of traditions and the blending of fixed cultural stereotypes. Some of Zhang's most challenging leaps across cultures are the paintings in the Shanshui Today series that fuse Chinese masterpieces with Cubism. Conceptually speaking, Zhang allies traditional Chinese painting's emphasis on one's imaginative transformation of nature with Cubism's departure from representation. Though Cubism is generally less associated with landscape than still life and figurative paintings, Zhang has found coherence in both approaches as they both build their compositions through abstract patterns. Oops, for some reason this one has chosen not to show up. Um, but in Zhang's 2008 remake of the 13th century Southern Song Dynasty painter Ma Yuan's water album, quotes the past while addressing issues of the present, in this case, the environmental issues that have become increasingly dire. Ma Yuan's album has been praised as one of the most exquisite depictions of water. But while adhering to Ma Yuan's style, Zhang deliberately adds color and other pictorial elements to conjure up images of pollution, smog, and dry riverbeds. Through these images, Zhang emphasizes how nature, the heart of Chinese shanshui paintings, is threatened by unbridled development. Without nature, what will become of art? More recently, Zhang Wontu has concluded his series of 39 ink paintings called Van Gogh Bodhidharma. This series is his longest spanning as it began in 2007 and ended in 2014. Here, Zhang reimagines the self-portraits of Vincent Van Gogh. He paints them in the classical Zen style, Zen style portraits of Bodhidharma, the monk credited with transmitting Zen Buddhism to China. The series is demonstrated of his sustained interest in collapsing the boundaries between politics, culture, and time. Zhang's most recent paintings feature bison as a central subject matter, 
and meditate on the impact of human activity on native animals and their environment. His bison roaming series, which began in 2018, was inspired by his sightings of bison during visits to the tall grass prairie of Kansas. Strong became especially interested in the history of the bison in the United States. After living on the land for thousands of years, they were indiscriminately killed by settlers. Though the bison population has been rehabilitated with human intervention, the wilderness that was once theirs has irrevocably been destroyed. John finds himself akin to the animal, saying, if bison can dream, they may dream of the wilderness where their ancestors lived. Today, as I write this during the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm not only isolated from people, but like the bison, separated from true wilderness and freedom. Now I can only imagine them through my paintings, drawings, and art. He continues to mix cultural iconographies, even when approaching his new subject matter. For example, his painting of a bison with frames directly cites Emperor Huizong's auspicious crane painting in the Song Dynasty. As shown by my rough outline, Zhang Hongtu is a master of looking backwards and forwards simultaneously with a great humanitarian mind constantly reflecting on the present he perceptively switches between styles iconographies and cultural signs to create a unique aesthetic of cultural hybridity in his paintings installations and other endeavors in his own words he dares to breed the horse with the cow or in other words defies expectations through his art by dissolving the fixed boundaries between past and present east and west the culture specific and the universal Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so now we open up for well, some dialogue. Or for yeah, I think the plan is that we're going to have some questions for the general officer and get a dialogue start and eventually we'll open it up for you to join in the conversation. What I'm I'm more before the end of the session. Um first of all I'm really great really really uh, honored by this uh, event the uh, the article invited by uh, you said the study, you said the study, and also <clears throat> supported by the uh, Foundation. Uh, so I have the opportunity to see you all, and also to listen to the talent presentation. Madam. 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 This is quite To me, like a uh, we call my whole life. I will go. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, John Lecher. So we're going to dig a lot deeper into your life now, if that's okay. Um, and, you know, just even watch, and thank you, Natalie, for such a wonderful summer. I think all of us as UCLA faculty are very proud to have students like you. Uh, so thank you for that wonderful overview. And we saw one touchstone theme that comes through your life's work is your engagement with politics from your youth making propaganda posters and then a generation later when you started your Mao series. And it went from being, you know, an engagement that on the one hand reinforced a period of time where all art was political and all art was basically propaganda during say the cultural revolution period in that time period. And then in the eighties and nineties, you undertake these series of works that have a very antagonistic and playful engagement with Mao and the socialist period. And so I'm wondering if you can just talk about how the political has changed and impacted your, your career. Um, and how has your stance transformed from your youth to the 90s? And after a long career that's stretched more than half a century, what are your thoughts today about the relationship between art and politics? <clears throat> yeah, this is a very, very important question because I also think of the uh, you know, uh, well, Actually, when I recall my like uh, maybe 16 years of art, uh, artistic career, not, not artistic career, but just 
done a lot of visual art school, the visual art, you now become professional artist. I recall this, uh, this kind of history. I think uh, everyone, you know, before you we start really into the art field, you are not really concerned about political things, not concerned about the, the market, not concerned about even the function of the art. You more enjoy the process of art. Uh, that's what I learned from my two granddaughters. I have two granddaughters, one is 10, one is seven. When they painting my studio, I stop my work. I watch them, they are my, my teacher. I find most important for those kids is the enjoyable of, of our art. You, they, they don't call it art, they don't call it painting. They just play with color, play with brushes, but uh, they did something really beautiful. Uh, I think, uh, uh, oh, yeah, Andy, uh, 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 Yes, Billy. Uh, Billy, 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 Billy visited my studio in this room. And uh, I think he had the same thing. Well, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but, but, but different time being. Now, in that time, I have no granddaughter. <laughs> now I talk, I talk, I displayed my granddaughter's story on, on the wall. I said with my work. And then, probably 85% of the chance, people visited my room, visited my studio, they said, oh, I like this one. Oh, my granddaughter. And that one, <laughs> Yeah, they are, they have no freedom. The most they, they really don't care about what's the style, what's the concept, what's the the uh, the, the, the trendy uh, uh, how to show opinion to to other people. They just do it, do it. They enjoy the process. In this case, I think as artists, you have to you have ownership to yourself. In change the world, you know, you know, you know, Okay. If you now as a writer, when you're writing, you have to with kind of attitude like yoga, but yoga, it's being spontaneous, being emotive. Yeah, your motive or your feeling that everything comes from your uh, inner, your spirit, your 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 your, your mind. Um, so. Uh, as I said in my student, when I come here, I forget about everything I said. I just want to do some so called pure art. Uh, anything is politically, politically a hidden. But uh, after the Tiananmen massacre happened in 1989, I was watching it on TV you know, 24 hours a day. I kept a lot of other uh, recorded from the scans and reports. So that's really. Touched me as a, and, and made me recall as a Chinese people came from China. What happened in my younger time? What happened when I was at the same age as a student in the China Gate? So after the, the tank, you know, uh, orange threw the Tiananmen uh, Square and uh, even destroyed the tank for students. Uh, and it was really great, great uh, degree. So after this part of the visual impact, I thought I cannot do what I said before this event, before this uh, master, so called the pure art. I have to do something related to my experience in China, to my life in China. That's the only way I can art, I can art as an artist, you can. You can speak out. You can spiritually support the Chinese thing. Because I thought, you know, without the re uh, um, exam, Chairman Mao, without the criticism, Chairman Mao, the Chinese democracy in China will be impossible. And the people will be, and as the this situation, just like sleep. We 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 sleep all the time for everyone. That's all from my life experience, not from my reading, not from my teacher told me. So that's why I thought if you have the uh, life experience, 
different with other people. Why you have to follow the mainstream art world to do something you're not familiar with? But maybe good for you financially, either to sell, uh, either, either to sell people, uh, uh, either to understand you. Yeah, Josh, I think this men uh, you mentioned something that I was just about to ask which is that Professor Lee did introduce Natalie and I as um, experts or of Chinese contemporary modern art. Uh, as much as I devote a lot of time studying um, artists like you, I truly don't think there's any likelihood for me to be an expert of you because the way in which you make art, um, it's so unbelievably sort of oppositional to the way we were trained and our art, art historians. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about this looming term of style that um, when we look at an artist, um, dead or alive, we expect to see a consistency. We expect to see you going to a school where you acquired the specialized skill set, probably in one medium, stain, uh, painting, sculpture. We expect you to spend the rest of your life to refine on such a technique and um, evolve progress, um, proliferate, whatever you want to, where you want to use. But what we have seen um, throughout um, Natalie's wonderful presentation of your career over 60 years is that that is completely um, nowhere to be found in that you, you are almost a nightmare to us art historians in that when I want to tell people, you know, this is John Lauscher's style, there's nowhere to be found. In other words, um, you're style is the lack of style and you have mentioned that that has proven to be challenging and interesting for you in terms of what art history or the museum or even the market um, expected of you so could you tell us a little bit more on okay. on mm. the issues of style yeah uh, i just added one more for the yeah for you it's quite true because of, uh yes uh all my standard work was very critical but i don't call this Serious, like political theory, mm. political work, it's just a China Mao theory. Because Mao himself is a political figure, so people concerned with the political work, even uh, call me like a very uh, political power artist. Mm. Uh, I don't call myself, I don't identify myself <coughs> as a political artist, but the political was part of my life. If I honor myself, mm -hmm. I don't have to avoid the political party. <coughs> Mm. Actually, you know, I met so many, uh, uh, my age, my generation, Chinese artists, we can share so many, many things about the political situation, but they don't do that. Mm. So that's, a, that's a kind of political action, actually. Yeah. If you ignore it, it's political influence, it's political action. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> that's that, that very your question. <clears throat> uh, because basically, while I'm doing my work, I have to contact the first. I have to contact the then as, as, uh, start you know, collect the images, collect the uh, visual uh, material from, from both history, Chinese history and uh, Western art history. The next is my big question. How do I to show this idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got an idea, I got an image, but uh, what is the technique? What kind of material I'm going to use? It? These are all style. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this question uh, is not only challenging, also gave me the opportunity to do something different. I'm very enjoyed. Um, that's, 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 that's what I'm going to say. Said, I do what I don't know how to do. Mm. So that's the way to learn something new. So I also enjoy to learn something new uh, to my different projects. So it sounds like it's the having fun. So going back to the grandchildren's example, outweighs the importance of creating a style. Would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. Well, here, if I may, I would like to uh, um, reflect a little bit. The um, John also mentioned that you um, you do your artwork, say so yoga and art. Work. So this is actually, uh, I think, in the heart of our creativity. You know, everything you do is a reflection of the mind at that moment. But the mind works in a very mysterious way. 
like you can go back and still kind of feel the future. So I think that's something that is essential for for the um, the true artist. Mm -hmm. You as if you don't think that much, you don't um set a goal. Say, oh, you know, this is a beautiful thing, painting. I'm gonna activate some something. But it's because your life experience is something touch your heart. So you feel, you know, you, you just, you know, um, spontaneous to do it. So I, I really think that's just a true artist, it's so sweet. So it's also usually, you know, you know, set the goal first. But actually, you're reflecting not only, you know, you as an artist, as a person, but also your environment, the things around you, but also your time, your history. So I, I think this is actually uh, very, um, for art historian, this is what we do. Yeah. <laughs> we study art history. You. Know, yeah. uh, so you, you seem to put it in a very mundane way, but actually, I think it's very profound. <laughs> I have a question about your formative years. And you know, all of our college students here are between the ages of 18 and their early 20s. This is the year, you won't realize it yet, but the books you're reading now, the films you're seeing, they're gonna, the music you're listening to, it has a really transformative effect throughout your life, that, that golden period. And for you, you came to the US 40 years ago, but 44 years ago, you have the open door policy and all of a sudden, Western music, philosophy, art, film, all these things start flooding into China. But at the same time, you also have this kind of rediscovery of Chinese cultural traditions which have been suppressed during the Mao period all come back. And this is also when you're finding yourself, it's just before you come to the US. I'm curious, during that period, say 78 to 82, when you came to the US, what were the, were there transformative works of art or literature? I know you've talked a lot about your trip to Dunhuang and how that impacted you during this period. But if you could share with us some of the touchstone moments during that early period in your life that shaped your later trajectories in art. Uh, a big question, actually. You can't have to recall what happened 44 years ago. Uh, but I'd like to, to answer it. Uh, you should show in my age. Sometimes you say that when you look back. I, I'm the same now. I even sometimes try, try to, look, try to uh, remember what was the song I yeah. <laughs> uh, it is a good question because uh, actually sometimes I cannot control myself. I even I ask myself, why you learn this one? You already started this series. You already started you know, showing and selling the series. My 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 my, my uh, gallery uh, really helped me helped me which means just to keep the, the one style to either to put in the market, the style. But uh, personally, uh, I thought that my life is a change a lot from China to here, from, from a Muslim family to a, uh, to a now real Buddhist, uh, at, at, at least a um, Buddhist art lover. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, also the uh, Renaissance stuff. Uh, in my mind, uh, so many things mix. Mix the yesterday and the today. Mix the different uh, cultures. Uh, mix the different religions. So what I'm doing is, uh, okay, this mainly it become, it's not from my heart, not from my uh, spiritual life, but from my uh, family. My family, uh, my father, my whole family moved in China many, many times. And uh, 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 I was born in the, uh, you know, I was born in 1943. You, 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 you can have better mathematics than, than I do. I'm 60 years older than the new China. So when I recall China, you can, I, I, I have to recall the, the Chinese modern history. So. In the same time, what I learned from Chinese philosophy is about yin and yang. Recently, I just re-studied yin and yang again and again. You know, the logo of yin and yang. Western circle and the 
align separate black and white. And the uh, on black part in the center is a small white part. On the white part is a black part. That's very, very simple. Um, now I think it's South Korean black, national flag still use this symbol. But in China, nobody really concerned what happened in China from this point of view. To my understanding, okay, everything is yin and yang. You have something bright, you have something black and shadow. You have something black, you have something red to to uh, contrast to contrast with the, the contrast. So that's the very simple philosophy. But I don't know why in China, from the highest leader to even to the philosophy of student, nobody talked about this part of Chinese philosophy. Okay, for example, um, that's also from, from my life experience. Uh, from 49 until today, communist party, communist uh, uh, goes through so many, many, many different political movements. One follows another one, one by one, one by one. That's my experience. <laughs> not from movies, not from the food. But nobody wants to recall what happened for the last uh, many 70 years. And I anyway, when I when I have a of the country, when I have all the past 10 years. Kind of helps you. Nobody wants to be caught. Nobody can um, do something to separate which one we, you did okay, okay, we did and you did very bad. I'm the one also influenced by the uh, Dan Bush's uh, uh, thinking. Why is this? You have to why you, why you, uh, uh, yeah, skepticism. Yeah, Be skeptical. Yeah, skeptical. Because this is only one for you to understand, to mean by, to, to see the world clear. Mm -hmm. This is the only way. If you don't uh, uh, doubt, okay, that's the government, the leader wants so called the uh, women of you. If you make people without it, uh, uh, it, it, it makes for easy governance to. When, if, if people were to know, have no skepticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. So, uh, uh, so, people ask me, you know, when we have so many good things, but you sometimes only talk about the bad things. That's my answer. That's the thing I mean. That's the reality. Right? If you don't think it this way, first of all, you're fooled by, by, by your leader. Secondly, you become lazy because uh, you don't have to change anything. If you buy the country, happens that you saw this is wrong, this is not good for, for, for Chinese culture, for Chinese people, you will, you, you will, you will have to, you will, you will try to, to change it. So that's why now, when even yes, when China just opened the, uh, the, the country to, to Western, uh, for a very short time, I, I feel it. Oh, hope. I feel hope. Oh, our oh, China, China going to change because. In the later 70s, early 80s, the government uh, allowed the country to write in the article book. So that's the key, very positive uh, period of the Chinese time. But uh, only a few years, only <coughs> the short, the year even shorter than this pandemic, the government said, okay, no more. They started, uh, uh, we call the because they had they started uh, criticizing any anybody uh, uh, really too much uh, Western philosophy, Western uh, uh, in garbage language, Western uh, try try uh, garbage to China. And uh, for me, it's another part of the attitude. Another. Uh, has to be against. So that's why I know my heart not really never followed. No, no, I, I cannot remember how to change the picture. 
is a parent of independent will. On the state, on the state, on the other side of the uh, China North uh, uh, oh, oh, okay, just like that. This is not, not, not only for China North, but sometimes still against China North unity. Use my own belief to still come so John, um, sorry to be the art history person here again. Um, so you mentioned the idea of importance of skepticism and that how that's an important value, not only to an artist, perhaps, but towards a, a living being. Um, so when you first moved here in the 80s, any specific works or artists, um, thinkers here in this country that make you feel like, wow, this person also embody the type of skepticism or if you want to be in the the dialectical thinking that has always been inside of you. I give you yeah. two examples. Sure. Yeah. Right, right now, I think here as uh, many, many other Chinese people. You know, we we uh we rumors uh, in this way. Okay, Chinese has a longer sort of history. Chinese art is a uh, uh, as but uh, Western people does not doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> okay, if we want to talk about this part, okay, this is the first example. I had the same uh, uh, concept like, like I have my mission. I came to, to America. I would let America know what is the real best Chinese art. Uh, especially I went to Dunhuang 1980. I came here in 1982. So uh, Dong Han uh, gave me the big, big, huge influence, uh, influence about what the real Chinese art. Because I also spent all my time in the kids uh, for early Dong Han, Dong Han, Dong Han, Dong Han, Mirror, like Beijing, Beiwei, Xixia. Because I, even those work is not really traditionally like, uh, like Zhang Daxian uh, copied the Dong Han. But to me, anyway, it's in this place, it's in Dunhuang place. But also, to me, it's a very example of how West, West is. Yeah. Because I heard many, many, many the monk painting, uh, monk painter, they uh, came from uh, Middle East, even from the uh, Persian. And uh, so, but, uh, but, uh, when shocking, river shop language changed my idea, which is a, a exhibition at uh, uh, Guggenheim Museum. Uh, I, I remember this other war text. He said, uh, uh, "National art is bad. Good art is national." That's really like a like a, like a shocking position. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Because the, for the first world, national art is bad. I also think national art is great. But the second one, good art is national. Nobody can create any art without any national background. But, uh, so you don't have to put the, the national style first. Now, before your art, if you have this, this kind of national uh, uh, art style uh, background, which is there, you don't have to worry about, it. oh, uh, in, in America, why I have to do something from America? I want to do something more Chinese. You don't have to do this. You don't understand this. If you have this, like, a dog has a tail. If you have this dog has a tail, tail, some dog for animals. <laughs> so if you don't have tail, that's a matter. You should, you should, you should kind of talk. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I think about the uh, as artist from from that um, uh, writing in Chinese, uh, in the Google uh, Museum. Second one, I told you, is the um, uh, artist. Her name is uh, Barbara Kruger. Um, he, she, she was the. Uh, uh, Nobody call her style like Chen style. She used her style like uh, Lenin and Hitler style, like propaganda style. Right. Uh, very 
simple black color, usually white, black, uh, and red. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but the image prefer the language. Language is uh, uh, as image mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to uh, to tell his her idea. And uh, I remember the uh, so called Bearbone Gallery. Uh, she used all of it for writing, fill up the, the whole gallery. One sentence, very simple, but I, I can never forget. She wrote, uh, My God, my God is better than your God. Uh, that's used like very simple language. Uh, we also learned that in China, uh, calm is, uh, is better than any uh, other system. Uh, you might, my own family, my, my, my father, he studied the Quran uh, 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 in Egypt. In Egypt. He, you know, uh, especially my, uh, my mother, my grandmother, they, they really uh, uh, literally uh, cry five times a day. Uh, I, so the religious part also learned from my family. A lot uh, Islamic is better than other religions. <coughs> Even I changed my idea. I thought maybe like somebody said, okay, uh, that's only different name, the same God. But still, hmm, maybe it's different. Otherwise, why is so many people do <laughs> this or something? But uh, later now, especially after the uh, uh, Gulf War, once, twice, uh, even <coughs> the war between uh, the Muslim people, and I mean inside the Muslim people, people uh, never stop fight between different religions or even the same religion. So that made me again start uh, rethinking about the what is uh, what is religion? We need religion, but uh, not this one. We cannot. We cannot hold the religion. We call. We cannot hold the book to against to against another book, and hold the Bible to against another Bible. That also from the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Mm. Chinese Cultural Revolution mm. after uh, later nineteen sixty six, the Sua and the we call it Wudou. So the Wudou means like a, a verbally you can uh, criticize other people. Wudou means the uh, militant. Yeah, militant use 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 weapon uh, to, to 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 kill each other. To fight with each other, but remember, every side, including including the, including the killer and the, the victims, people all call the Chairman Mao's book. People only read Chairman Mao's book as a motivation, as a dong li, as a uh, motivation to to kill other people, to kill other people. So that's also um, uh, the result to me. It's a uh, in my idea about uh, who is China now, why is the uh, country contribution, and uh, why I uh, why come here. I'll be thinking of contribution. Well, uh, if I may, again, I, I actually would like to um, kind of reflect a bit about, you know, um, Zhang Hongzhu and the uh, skepticism. <laughs> I found that uh, um, this is actually very critical, that uh, we're skeptical, but in a positive way, right? We pose and we think. So, uh, uh, you know, knowing him almost 30 years, I now can re recall many, many things. Uh, the first of all is that there's a wonderful documentary called Making Mouth. I think we talk pretty extensively about the Mouth series, Making Mouth. The, many artists, uh, art historian, uh, you know, art critic, and uh, cultural historian, all being interviewed. And the every time I show that thirty-five minutes uh, documentary to the class, and they immediately, you know, um, Zhang Hongtu instantly became our hero, <laughs> our students' hero, because he was the only one extremely down to earth, and uh, you know, <coughs> talk about his own experience, and uh, and and again. Uh, skeptical, but so sincere and genuine. 
and thinking. So um, Ricky Mao, but I also think when he talked about yin yang, right, um, actually it exists in the whole tradition of Chinese, uh, you know, philosophy and art, you know, in painting, you know, the negative space, if I don't hate unpainted art, right, it's open is more important than painted art. Um, and the, um, what Zhang Hong to was uh, cut out now, right, just a silhouette, is so haunting me and it's even more powerful. So the presence of uh, Mao is in the absence that uh, I'm quoting uh, <laughs> Natalie just now. And, and I even uh, reflect, when I just got to know uh, Hong Chu uh, 28, 27 years ago, uh, my daughter was just born, um, one year old, and he was a, she was a model baby. Uh, everybody you know, adored her, and then I was kind of proud mom, you know, the first child. And then, you know, uh, I mentioned to Hong Chu, and she said, wait, you know, when they are easy, when they're uh, young, someday they'll get to you. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that he's kind of always skeptical, you know, about, about this. And uh, so I think he's a very forward-looking, very positive um, uh, about a lot of things. But on the other hand, uh, I think down to earth, uh, uh, the, in the bottom line, you, you are also pretty cosmetic person, it's very much performing the, um, the Chinese Taoist idea, Uji Bi Ban, that you don't believe that, you know, when things reach the epic, you know, it's the time, it's also, it's going down here, right? So uh, this is a, a circle, so it's very philosophical, but um, I, I found that actually um, everywhere in your art. Well. I'll jump in with a question about your process. And I think it would be really fascinating if we could get a kind of inside look, pick any one of your works, the Mao series, the Sanche series, but pick one and if you could walk us through the conceptual process of developing it, expanding it, how it changed over time. Because let's take for instance, the Mao series, it wasn't just one or two, it was, I don't know, maybe dozens if not hundreds of different works um, that took on different iterations. And could you, Kind of take us on a tour through what that process was like from conception to the transformation and when you decide to bring it to a close then move on to the next process <clears throat> mm -hmm. actually Tomorrow, if you go to my another talk, I will uh, take, I will try kind of some this kind of story. But uh, when you mentioned about Cooper, or Cooper, I can tell you today. <clears throat> yeah, anyone that you find most, the most fascinating story to share? Uh, um, oh, you know, let's like, like just like a visual art mentioned about the Tarao. Mm -hmm. uh, Cut out. Yeah. Yeah, this is a few moments. Okay, the cut out. I cut out uh, around the 30, no, around 40 different kind of mat, uh, material. Uh, but the same concept, the same image, but different material. Uh, the idea comes from, again, yin and yang. But uh, when I pick up the material, not only in and yang. For example, this is more like in a circle and the contrast between, between something exists, something, something is an empty space. And uh, actually, uh, when I do this one, I'm not only uh, uh, recall my life in China, because I, I use two kinds of uh, uh, yeah, we should, uh, friends. Friends. My friends, that one is the US. Because Northern Chinese people almost only eat corn and, and, and wheat. And uh, Northern people, the Southern, Southern Chinese people eat uh, rice. So these two kinds of material are uh, already representing now mainly Chinese people. And uh, the color of, of, of course, more like a propaganda painting to the Cultural Revolution, because now all is a uh, red face and yellow uh, light, yellow light, the 
of that thing. So yellow on the right always uh, representing political representing China. Uh, even today, nobody can change the yellow and red from ten to nine. And, uh, and, uh, in the same time, uh, I'll do this one is 1992. Uh, I had a let's let's send to I think send to many many Chinese people when come here for the first few years uh, had a uh, uh, eating problem because uh, uh, for example I thought uh, I was bread the net nineteen cents you can buy like this this uh, uh, size of bread yeah it's too small too small it's a really not like a you food. Uh, um, but uh, after I find a bagel, I thought, wow, let's go there. So I eat bagel every day. So this one also, idea comes from bagel. So bagel, you only, you only eat the material part. You don't need the, the center, the, the, the empty space. But without the empty space, that now they call it bagel. So, so I'm getting the official confirmation that it is a New York bagel <laughs> that it inspired the uh, Mao cutout series. <laughs> uh, not 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 hundred percent of York, but it's but uh, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, actually you now you know some some philosophy idea can comes from your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um so when this all this things happen at the same time, so why you the uh, um, Food. Actually, it's not an enjoyable process. You have to stand up the corn one by one with kind of glue, glue on a glue on a, uh, uh, around the cut of the small image uh, around a, a, a piece of uh, work. Uh, this one is uh, okay. The one with the, the rice, no, no, it's a, um, uh, uh, yeah, the rice, even take a longer time. Uh, but because I, because I thought the, the idea is really uh, sentient from my heart. I don't know how to write. I don't know how to make music. But this work I can say something to me. So I still enjoy the process. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 However, you want to take it. Maybe, maybe you could, because you started, this came after the earlier Mao mm -hmm. images, right? Where you no, take no, to, actually after. Yeah, after. This is 1999. Right. So, uh, no, no, no. Uh, that's, that's later. Yeah, uh, the earliest uh, is the Quickos Mao, then the last time, then the Trial Mao, Trial Mao, Trial Mao, Trial Mao, Trial Mao, yeah. Right. So could you maybe just add a little more about the transition from that earlier mouse series to this one? Okay. Uh, I am thinking about the uh, quotation now. There's a new name. I, I don't call it, I just call it quite a lot. And uh, <clears throat> um, um, after the piano master, one thing I thought last, which is small, because I thought mouse is really uh, Hypocritical. <laughs> yeah, hypocritical. Hypocritical. Yeah. And because what he said, he didn't do. What he uh, asked our as a student to do, he never done that. And what he read in his book, very beautiful writing. Even, even recently, I still read it. He said, as a people, I really can say anything you want. And Zhu uh, Wuyan, uh, if you know, you, you, you don't stop your talk, talking. Young British, if you start talking, never stop. Uh, 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 as, a, as a speaker, you never. Uh, uh, There's no sin. No sin. No, you, you, no, nobody punish you because you have to read. Say, as a listener, I always can find something uh, I can now make change. Uh, is good for me. But in the reality, what is the reality? I don't have the time. You know that. The reality, the reality was terrible, terrible. <coughs> Especially as a, my personal uh, experience. My father was running as a writer. You know what's the writer? It happened in many weeks. You just said, Mao asked intellectuals to, uh, 
to criticize Communist Party. They said, okay, if, if you can find something wrong with us, with our Communist Party, you can tell us, we're going to, do, uh, to, to cor uh, uh, correct it, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But actually, um, only, only like one month, two months, he collected all the criticized war. He labeled all the people criticizing him as righteous. In this way, he makes uh, all the intellectual become quiet. Nobody dare to say anything. <laughs> because, for example, my father's uh, salary, salary uh, lower three levels. My mother lost a job. Uh, before that, uh, we have five kids you know, go to school, no problem. After that, I remember every school, uh, uh, at the first day go to school, I have to bring a, uh, a note when my father wrote. In Jiaqing, Jing Yi, Kun, Zhang Huan, Zhou Zhe. So, yeah, <laughs> Chang Wang had to bring a note um, that says that due to financial constraints, mm -hmm. um, we are delaying the payment of our tuition. Mm -hmm. So, this is just a very personal uh, experience. I, actually, many people died after the anti racist uh, so called movement. And uh, yes, my, my another uh, uncle, he was called to write it. He actually is a council party member and he working very hard. But uh, even today, I don't know why he was a labor party artist. He was a senator to Liaoning, Liaoning and uh, uh, family. Many, many people. Uh, I, I really suggest you to read some uh, uh, version of a new Chinese book about this part of the Chinese history. It's terrible. So, uh, so in my life experience, also mixed, something good, something bad, something, you know, um, something terrible. And uh, uh, to do my work is one way to get away, get away from this kind of bad influence. Even now, I don't like it. I can criticize it, but still, for image, what happened to my family? What happened to many, many of my friends, my relatives? I cannot get off. Get off. Just like, just like when I do the, uh, the quick I said, okay, uh, I try to forget everything happened in China. But uh, you never can get away from, you, you never can erase most image from your mind. So that's why I know. Uh, Sorry, maybe, maybe. No, 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 perfect, perfect, <laughs> fine. Yeah. We also um, want to ask uh, Natalie to, you know, pitch in, maybe yeah, yeah. pose a couple questions. But before that, may I again just amend a little bit? Because uh, I, um, so, you know, Zhang Hongfu have carried all these, uh, the, the, the memory, you know, the shadow and the psyche, you know, leading through Mao era to New York. So, um, 1995, I, I, she made an impression to me. I wrote an article in a catalog for the significance of the data. <laughs> Talk about reporting, you know, just uh, cite your experience. So his first, uh, you know, encounter is this kind of way to ward off, you know, this uh, haunting uh, uh, nightmare uh, by confronting it. So all these uh, more images, right? He uh, really um, different um, but then I, I see the sort of the process since uh, uh, Michael had mentioned the process. I see it very clearly. I mean, from Quaker Mao to uh, Mao Ping Pong, Mao, um, the last banquet, and to Kalao Mao, you know. So, and again, talking about even, yeah, and I feel it's gradually, you know, kind of trans transcends trans to uh, the actual economy. So, I actually really think that Kalao um, Mao. 
say so much <laughs> about your own personal mm. you know, trajectory and you pursue this and uh, your artistic journey. So, Natalie? Yeah, I really wanted to chime in. Thank you so much. Um, um, I have a question that kind of goes off of um, Professor Berry's earlier question about uh, Kamalashu's earlier life. And my, my question is, um, how has your training as a commercial artist affected your practice? Um, do you think um, that this has compelled you to venture out into so many different mediums like bronze, ceramics, etc.? So that's my first question. <clears throat> um, first of all, no, uh, I'm the one that tries to, to reject what happened to me. <laughs> I don't like that. Uh, every day, think about the uh, the choice. You know, the, and the compare which one is good for me, which one is bad for me. I'm not this kind of person. Uh, anyway, uh, anytime people can learn something new, it's just a learn. I thought it's interesting. Even I don't use it to make money, but still I learn something. And uh, that's made me uh, uh, into this uh, easily go into the uh, Central Academy. Art and art. Uh, another reason to go there because of the, the Central Academy of Fine Art was closed for, I think, three or four years. Uh, that's really a long story. Because 19, uh, 19, 19, 19, no, no, 1964, I graduated from high school, which is an art school. Supposedly, supposedly, we go to go to Central Central Academy of Fine Art, but the teacher said, "Okay, now now move this school because of school closed for another two years." But actually, later I learned uh, Jiang Qin, the mouse wife, uh, that her uh, order to close those school. The Art Revolution. Officially started in 1966, but actually 1964, already, already, you know, already, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so, um, uh, so, when going to the uh, uh, school for art and craft, they have teachers going to my school to, to, to promote their school, to attract people to go there. So, one of the, uh, the one, one of the from the uh, Central Academy of Cars and the Crops, uh, Crops and uh, Crops, uh, English, yeah, went yeah. into my uh, class, the using the ceramic department. One word, uh, you know, China, my idea. Because before that, I thought I'm still fine art, I'm like, no, creative art, I'm only uh, not Picasso, but remember that, <laughs> Da Vinci. But then this guy, he said, uh, you know, who went to, who started ceramic? They give some example of the famous artist, including Picasso. I don't know Picasso art, but I know. It's great art. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so that's the only, this is the reason I go to this school and apply it. No, I apply it this department. Mm. And actually, we didn't really learn anything because that's in 1964. Then 1966, we all, the school all closed. Uh, and uh, other school, graduated from school, they came to the countryside, another three years. Uh, almost a half of your life. <laughs> but uh, you know, during the, all the study, the country that I like, uh, I learned different uh, uh, scale, different way to do this particular period. Yeah. Uh, it, actually, it's a, um, in college, I learned it's not, it's not called the commercial art. So they teach. Uh, we do call it, we also do call it the uh, ceramic art. We call it reuse ceramic for people's daily life. Eventually, it's going to 
Well, um, you know, the among us, I actually um, would like to invite uh, our audience because um, we have run almost one hour thirty minutes, and uh, I believe all of us have a lot of questions, not to say, but we want to give our audience uh, opportunity. If you have any, uh, would like to make a decision with artists on home to go, or you know, any question to me for the artist or any of us. Ah, yes, Norma. <laughs> I, I can just see on your phone. How your painting, in, uh, how the Chinese student today in China understand your painting? Is number one. How China like your painting? Do they accept your painting today? First of all, uh, I haven't really been to China for a long time. And uh, not really uh, contact with a student or, or there a long time. But the one thing I know, uh, there are two kind of people interested in my painting. One is uh, the one girl, my painting can be sold for here. So <laughs> he sent me some slides. He said, uh, can you give you a no, direction about my mouth image? He asked me for a gallery representing. I said, I cannot do that. Because we have totally different um, idea and and uh, uh, religion and the uh, uh, experiment, uh, uh, experiment, uh, uh, experiment with China Mao. You do your China Mao is different with my China Mao. But that doesn't mean our China Mao can be sell. <laughs> and uh, for the government, I never, I never show any of my work in China. Never. Even, even the uh, critique, the uh, curator, uh, even many, many of the people. Even in my generation, they, they should understand what I'm doing, but the people, they have to protect it themselves. I understand that. So I'm, I never really push them to do anything. Uh, and and uh, my shen shui, and uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, shen shui painting is okay. I showed my shen shui painting, but I never saw it. <laughs> Audience questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I really love your work. And um, it, just for me, as I was like listening to, to all of what we're talking about, um, I was just thinking there is like something about working on a distant land from where I grew up. Actually, not something. There's so much about that. Um, and we like talk so much about the structural violence of like all of these, you know, structures that we kind of live in. And um, and for me, like when I was seeing your um, paintings, for me, it's like, it kind of really gives me this way of like looking at, um, at land from a really um, open perspective in a way that, that like, I don't know, that just um, is a really like poetic relationship to, to land, to thinking about place, to thinking about space. Um, and that, that kind of just uh, it, like non-violently counters all of you know, all of the kind of things that we talked about. So I was just wondering like um, how, like we, you know, we talked about the conceptual development of your work, but I'm just wondering like affectively, spiritually, how are you relating to land when you work, especially on your um, Shen Shui pieces that has such an intimate relationship with land? Okay. <clears throat> um, I actually, I didn't really, uh, I, I, I did do this on uh, purpose, but the just want to uh, um, uh, I find something more important. Actually, this related to my study. I didn't talk about uh, my study anymore. Um, um, so the negative part of my study is a very, very conservative uh, uh, system we learned from way imported from the Soviet Union called the Socialist Reading, which is a uh, the artist uh, has to be uh, School or, or gear, the gear, school and the gear for the revolutionary machine. That's what we learn. We, we trust, we, we believe that. 
And uh, <clears throat> that also gives you some loss, mm, a positive difference, which is uh, your art is not only yourself. It's representing your feeling, representing your idea. But if, if this kind of work can be shared with other people, then that's even better, even better than your personal experience, then more people can share with you. Uh, so, so that's why now, uh, uh, after a few, after one or two years, I, I thought I'm going to do something like pure art, but uh, uh, I transport to, not transport, just shape the tool, I mean, most image, very, very naturally. That's because the positive part I learned from China. So we, we remove all, just, uh, we remove all, the world is too- Art in service of people. Yeah, the service people share with other and uh, communicate with other. Uh, but uh, uh, after, <clears throat> after doing the political things, Chairman Mao's image, and uh, uh, I think more influence from uh, from Tushan, from Dada, Dada Art, uh, even Andy Warhol. Not directly, I, I didn't really uh, to learn them uh, as a student to study them, but uh, I read a little bit. I went to the museum all the time. I know basically the idea of what artists influence me a lot. But to show, okay, artists now hungry. He is the one really uh, pushed boundary very, very far away. That's opened my mind. But to show, now for Ali uh, he's just a uh, uh, do art, make art. Uh, now, he, no, what I learned from him is uh, okay, blur the, blur the boundary between art and the life, blur the boundaries between. High art, like the high art, like the classical level, like the museum art, and the, and the so called lower the art from the society. When he now lower this boundary, boundaries between the different art is also a way open my mind. I can do anything if I do the right way. I can do anything. Uh, uh, I don't have to only use what I learned in the school. That's also opened my mind. In the same time, I can learn so many different skills. I can learn so many different uh, techniques. Why not? I you learned some, I mean, like, that's a few years ago, like, like, VR, like a virtual reality. I didn't do any artwork, but it's just, uh, I just want to understand how important it is this kind of, as an art, uh, it's a kind of art format. I didn't do any uh, like personal thing to work. But I learned, learned a little bit more. Other questions? Audience? Huh? Question. Hour. I don't need a moment. <laughs> I'm my focus of the recording. Professor John said, you said you must enjoy what you did, which I think that is correct. The question comes from a non academia, mm -hmm. non artist. My question is as an artist, in my view, is always expand the boundary of life. If you're not expanding boundary of life, then you're just one of the past. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how else can describe it. But enjoy, just enjoy is not good enough. But as you said, you better have some perception of what other people evolve. Your mouse picture, they have many meaning to other people who look at I mean, you don't have to say, I look at that, it's stunning. 
Look at that. He's lying, son of a bitch. I mean, that's what art is supposed to do. Explain the thing. And they can get away from dictatorship or any other things. My wife collects paintings. I look at the painting and all of them have meaning during the during the suppression of the mind of a certain period of time. The artists have a way to express it. And so my point is that is not just enjoy what you're doing. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. I it's more than that. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Power totally. Approve, <laughs> <laughs> approve. No, I, I actually, when um, I seen the um, abstract of my talk to uh, Michael, I mentioned this. I said, I'm not going to talk about the people said the art is a mirror to reflect the reality. My point of view is art, art is the art work to be part of the reality. But that reality. is reality <laughs> of that time. Yeah, they're not only this hand. <laughs> you know, I mean, how long it lasts, no. that depends. Depends point of view. Mm -hmm. But as a whole, <coughs> he was, is the way it is, how it turned out. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I think it's going to last a while. What are we can eat two hours? No, no. I'm the one you go out. I'm, I'm a very stubborn man, actually, very, very stubborn man. I'm hard to change my idea. But once I change it, I will keep it the way I work. This is something uh, as an artist uh, also related to your personality, uh, your, your attitude. And uh, 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 let's also answer your question. Chinese artists within my studio, they said, oh, a lot of people all the back to China, especially in the 19, middle of 1990, uh, 20 years ago, many people back to China. They, the student asked me, why don't you go back to China? You can get a bigger uh, studio. You can get a lot of, lot of uh, system, and, uh, assist, uh, assistant, assistant. Is it true? Is it true? But I said, how can I can you know, how I can continue my work? He said, I understand that, but you don't have to do your work. You can do something else. Something else. I, I also understand that, but I'm not the same person. Yes, I can do any, any I can do so many things to, to make a living, but uh, I cannot uh, to 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 give up my art. As an exchange, I can do it. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, how do you believe your general malice series will be interpreted um, by almost future generations? How do you how do you believe your general malice series will be interpreted by future generations who are only able to read about it and aren't really known firsthand? You know, before you answer, maybe we can get there was a second question here. Yeah. Why don't we get two or three questions and then have oh, no. to answer today? Thank you for this uh, wonderful discussion and um, like presentation. I really, really like the idea of how Yi and Yang um, kind of facilitate the non of movement uh, between black and white. Uh, I'm sort of curious, uh, what do you think? This kind of binary thinking from Mao age influences uh, more than Chinese society. Um, yeah, thank you so much. One, one more, or was... yeah, I... okay. Uh, hi, hi, uh, John Lashir. Thank you so much for uh, giving us this wonderful, uh, uh, like, uh, like your own uh, conceptualizations of this. Uh, uh, very great uh, art that you have built uh, like within the last uh, 40 years. Uh, and I'm uh, really uh, curious about 
uh, and I couldn't help but uh, noticing uh, that you you you, you mentioned uh, the concept of like being honest uh, of uh, like this is not uh, politics and you are just being honest of your your life and we also talk about how uh, an art and reality couldn't be separated but in looking at your art uh, is also is quite different from the socialist realist painting which is um, like a representation of you know some some of this daily life everyday life um, so i'm curious um, do you think that the socialist realist painting the the so called the uh, kind of art uh, having an influence on you uh, or not or how do you uh, think that you like later on like develop this uh, uh, these uh, your own style that's quite different from uh, the kind of uh, like oil paintings that we commonly see in uh, a lot of these national Chinese uh, art gallery. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, usually, usually I don't think too much about uh, what happened after my death. <laughs> Um, and just actually give you a that I have just uh, uh, frankly to tell you. And uh, uh, not 100%, a lot of people still know what in my art. I think the same uh, show my, my art, of, of course. But uh, I really don't care about the, how people criticize my art. Because uh, people from different backgrounds, different uh, cultures, uh, even from different families, different language, we definitely have different point of view about uh, not only me about any artwork. I also as a as a some student now, you know, as I look at you, you know Mona Lisa. Piso knows Mona Lisa. Our world knows Mona, Mona Lisa. This has this is the most beautiful <laughs> smile. But if you show this one to China in the countryside. In the mountain, I guarantee you, no any single one like this image. I, 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 I can guarantee you. This, 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 so many, many things for art. You art, art is part of culture. Culture is uh, you have to learn. That's the same thing, same thing happened to me. One learned, my teacher taught us. Uh, in, the, in the high school, that uh, how bad is Western art? They put uh, the Western Western Museum, put the Yuri in the museum, said this is art. No, you're not. So the Duchamp, famous yeah. Duchamp piece. <laughs> and uh, uh, girls naked uh, put a color on body, dancing on the floor, then they sell the painting. On the floor, this art. Of course, I've heard this uh, uh, de de described from my teacher. I thought Western art, no, Western art, it is bad. So what can be why why are the into to some to some things to some to some art art level earlier than other Chinese artists because I want to know how bad to some is. But in, in this, this this my in, interest into Duchamp's art. So I started reading his interview as well, the uh, visit museum again and again. Then I got his idea. Even some single work I'm not really uh, back so much, but I got it. My question was from the 
prospect of when I looked at this, my first question was, who was that? Because I was unfamiliar with Chairman Mao. In the future, you think oh, people yeah, will yeah. this okay. say, oh, it's, it's a great piece of artwork, but who is that? And they will lose kind of like the importance of the message due to a lack of knowledge of who is actually in the depiction. Okay, uh, <clears throat> there's two parts for, for, for my understanding of the question. <clears throat> Future people, this, this cannot, uh, you cannot give me a definition which is future people. But future, future people, including people, people never saw Mazdu, they don't know Mazdu, they want to know how was Mazdu's image looks like, not, not from my opinion. My, from my opinion, they never can get it. What, what was the image of Mazdu? But uh, if you are studying about the uh, change modern history, you want to know more about uh, the background of my work, of uh, the most, in, most influence in China. I think uh, you can. Maybe, not, not you, maybe this, this kind of person will pay attention to my work. How to tell how deeply understand or how deeply uh, study my work. But uh, I only can tell, I can tell the future people only one more, they will be interested. Don't to opinion the China Mao. China Mao was China's leader. But uh, China not allowed the China Mao, not, not allowed them to show his Chinese, uh, China Mao's painting. You are curious why? Why this Chinese guy painting his leader, Chairman Mao, but Chairman Mao's country doesn't want him to show his work? Why, why has a why you can decide? Maybe I can help put in perspective. You know how many Mao's portraits have been produced during Mao's era and continue? So uh, Zhang Hongtu's artwork certainly is unique. <laughs> Even there are a lot of Mao Pop, but every Mao Pop actually has a different you know, approach. And just like he mentioned, artists will consult him. How you know? How do I get uh, um, Gerald to sign me? You know, I can produce more image. And, you know, what can I take? And, you know, what have a market? And he said, "That's not my concern." <laughs> my approach is my experience, my case. Next question. Yeah. <clears throat> oh yes, about my social determinism education. Yes, and. <clears throat> uh, I learned something very important, which is a basic uh, technique. I can do very good drawing, watercolor. Um, um, also, conceptually, uh, I, I will talk uh, today. I learned one thing is important. As artists, uh, your art does not belong to yourself. When you show your art to the public, uh, uh, to the public, the public has uh, um, the right to criticize your work. In the same time, uh, but from the um, maybe from the positive part, they also can share your idea. So that's influence my later work a lot. So I want to share. You cannot share everyone. Not any other work can face everyone. Not this kind of work in the world. But uh, you can share with somebody. That's enough. You only two people. We also have a little bit notes. I think that uh, his generation of academic training, it turns up, you know, it's really solid. So this uh, socialist realist approach really is um, So that's why I actually gave him, equip him. It's a very good tool. Uh, so he was able to take tackle all the, take on all those classical painting and then trick it, you know, and repaint it and giving it uh, a, a new meaning. Uh, without that foundation, it would be very hard to do. Just uh, lastly, do we have the fun quan? <coughs> uh, or even while she is in the early spring, this is the can the be more classical, maybe it's the landscape painting, E1000, or the early spring, 1072. Uh, in terms of the form, Okay, third question. Oh, 
I was kind of, I feel like a lot of, a lot of it's been covered through Donald's question. Right. Mao's really, yeah, Mao's has his relation with modern, modern Chinese history. Yeah, I think probably all of us have more questions, but we still have part two tomorrow. So maybe we should pause here and please join me in thanking the master, uh, John Lasher. Thanks again to my co-panelists, our wonderful graduate students, Professor Lee, the Lee family for sponsoring the series, Mr. Joe, and all of you for taking your Friday afternoon with us. So tomorrow, same time, but different place. We're going to be at the Fowler Museum at one o'clock. Oh, so tomorrow's at two. <laughs> two o'clock, and then we will have a two presentation tomorrow. Uh, Professor Lynn will be presenting um, via Zoom, even though he can't be here physically. But so meet us at the auditorium. So take some food with you before you go. Feel free to take sandwiches and snack. And see you tomorrow at the Fowler Museum. So as I just to play very clarify, tomorrow the Zoom part will be the forecast on the big screen. On the big screen. So everyone should still come to the auditorium. And then so we'll have Professor Lin's presentation first and then uh Tom also afterwards. So thank you all. Have some food on your way out. Thank you, everybody. And if you're in Chinese party, I have a tiny machine here. If you're in Chinese party, you have a tiny machine. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>